so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. The following episode contains the retelling of traumatic events. Listener discretion is advised. It's June 15, 1998, a cool winter's evening on Sydney's northern beaches. The leafy, quiet and friendly suburb of Belrose is located about 19 kilometres northeast of Sydney's CBD. For a man named Brett Boyd, it's no accident that he lives there. The 27-year-old had moved away from the bustling nightlife of King's Cross. His friends were involved heavily in the club scene, some dealing drugs like cocaine. Elements of the work had begun to scare him, and so he retreated to a suburb where he felt safe. Arriving home on that Monday in June at about 6.30pm, Brett noticed a package waiting at the door. It was addressed to his girlfriend, 23-year-old bikini model Simone Chung. They'd met through a mutual friend and had been dating for a few years. Simone wasn't home at the time, and so Brett instinctively picked the package up. A neighbour would later report hearing a loud explosion, the kind of sound that stood out. They then saw Boyd walk from his doorstep on Opala Street before collapsing. An explosion had broken windows and blasted holes through the carport. Debris even landed on the roof of the shed next door. What Brett had picked up was a bomb designed to kill. But who had left it there? And why was it addressed to his girlfriend? When Brett woke up in hospital, he was convinced he knew the answer. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations. A Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with true crime authors Poppy Damon and Alice Fines about the 1998 Belrose parcel bombing and Roberto de Heredia's subsequent pseudocide. In 1988, a parcel arrives at a man named Brett Boyd's house. What's inside the parcel? So inside that parcel was a bomb that had been designed to have a pressure plate that detonated when it was picked up. Now, this was a homemade bomb made of soda stream gas bottles and steel bolts. How much damage was the person who made this wanting to inflict? Police later determined that this was a pretty serious device. It was designed to kill. We actually spoke to a bomb blast expert who told us it was constructed to kill. And, you know, it was incredibly lucky that Brett Boyd actually managed to survive. The bomb was left outside Brett's house. And when he picked it up, there was an absolutely huge explosion. And interestingly, it wasn't actually addressed to him, was it? It was addressed to someone else. That's right. It was addressed to Brett's girlfriend, who today goes by Simone Starr, but back then she was going by Simone Chung, who was quite an interesting lady. She's had quite a varied career. So back then she was a model and penthouse pet. This is in 1998. And she's reportedly also a high class escort at this time. And then after the bombing, she moves to the US. She pursues a career as a singer. She's much later convicted of having a principal role in an international drug syndicate. She's arrested in 2019, getting off a plane from Hawaii for importing methamphetamine. But back in 1998, she's not living at Brett's home, but she's spending lots of time there. And she and Brett are rumoured to be setting up an internet porn business together. 60 Minutes reporter Liam Bartlett sat down with Brett Boyd's sister Susan in 2019 and here's what she had to say about Simone. What sort of girl was Simone? I mean, as Brett would say to me, Simone would go out to buy some milk and come back three days later with no milk. <laughs> so, <laughs> she was a bit wild. Yes, yeah, she was a bit of a wild girl. Do you think Brett was involved in any sort of illegal activity? 
Look, I d- I'm not aware of any illegal activity. Poppy, do you think that it was intended for her, that parcel, or do you think that it was intended for Brett, even though it had Simone's name on it? It's a really good question, and it's one that the police really grappled with at the time. So obviously, as you said, the bomb was addressed to Simone, but it was spelt incorrectly. We don't know of any reason at the time that someone would want to hurt Simone, but it was possibly for her. That is, you know, a whole line of inquiry that perhaps has not been explored. But at the time, they decided that Brett had been the intended recipient. Basically, it was to make it less suspicious, it meant that he just picked it up without thinking about it. He saw Simone's name. Apparently, she often had shoes and, as Alice mentioned, perhaps pornography delivered to the house. And without thinking, he kind of picked it up. So it's a big question hanging over the case. You know, who was it really addressed to? And when he picked it up, you mentioned before that it was a bomb designed to kill. It wasn't successful, though, because it only half exploded. What injuries did Brett ultimately sustain as a result of that? So Brett was really seriously injured in the blast. He was thrown over the bonnet of his car by the force of it. And he suffered severe burns and lacerations to his skin, particularly on his face. His sister Susan rushed to the intensive care unit where he was being kept after the attack. And when she saw him, she said he was just horrifically mutilated. It was like someone had thrown a bucket of blood and a bucket of gunpowder all over his face. His right thumb, where he bent down to pick up the bomb, had been blown off. He ended up losing his left eye. Um, He wore an eye patch over it afterwards and he suffered severe damage to his right eye. At one point, they thought he might lose his right eye as well. His eardrum was blown out by the blast and he wasn't only physically disfigured, but he was really traumatised as well. He was also sadly left with, you know, some emotional scarring. Who was Brett? Because to have a bomb in Sydney is extremely rare. I can imagine that would have attracted a lot of police attention. Who was he? What did he do for a living? What did they sort of think the motive might be? So Brett was a Sydney resident and bodybuilder. You can see in pictures he's extremely good looking. He kind of trained people personally in a quite serious gym. And many kind of thought he was quite vain, maybe even arrogant. But his sister said that confidence actually concealed a sort of shyness and he, that he was actually quite gentle. Uh, she told us this story about how he'd won a Mr. Australia competition in 1993 and he actually didn't tell any members of the family until after it was over. But to supplement his training business in the gym, he was also a nightclub bouncer in Sydney. And at that time, this was quite a grimy, drug fueled scene. So there was some speculation at the time that you know, his involvement as a bouncer in these clubs and with some unsavory sorts might have made him the target for a bomb. But this was, again, the the very early question was sort of, how does this gorgeous bodybuilder who seemingly you know, didn't have any obvious enemies end up with a, a parcel bomb addressed to his girlfriend? The name Robert D. Heredia came up pretty quickly. What led police to him? Well, Brett and Roberto were friends. So Roberto de Heredia was a shopping channel host who was living and working in Sydney back then, but originally from the UK. And as I said, Brett and Roberto knew each other. Roberto says today that they were acquaintances more than anything else. But Brett's sister Susan says that they were very close, that Roberto even spent Christmas with the family one year, and they also worked out together at the gym. For me, he was a great guy. You know, we, uh, I didn't know him that well. We went to the gym together, um, sometimes had lunch together. So you were good mates? Good mates? We were mates. We were mates. That's Roberto D. Heredia talking about his relationship with Brett Boyd. So if that's true and they were only acquaintances, then what was the suspected motive? So Brett also later told police that he actually owed Roberto $80,000, that he borrowed that from him, possibly to start that internet porn business. But that's something that Roberto denies. Did you ever lend in any way, shape or form any money to Brett Boyd? Absolutely not. Nothing. I didn't have the money to lend. This is something Roberto D. Heredia maintains to this day. He believes he was part of an elaborate cover-up of which he was the fall guy So who was Roberto and what did he do for a living? He's a shopping channel host, which, you know, is one of those activities where you have to be very fast on your feet. He's selling 
flab fighting equipment. He's selling different medications and carving knives, anything you can find on a shopping channel. So he was a kind of world of fake tan, very white teeth. This is the World of Collectibles Week, starting off with Sunday, a two-hour World of Collectibles special. I have any takers. Was there any DNA or evidence linking him to that bomb? So police said that they found Roberto's DNA on the stamps used when the parcel and the postal card that was left at Brett's house. But Roberto refutes this. He says, you know, that he was the victim of a corrupt police investigation. And so, you know, eventually he was investigated and arrested for attempted murder. How do you explain your DNA on those stamps? I can't. You see, I don't believe my DNA was on those stamps. I don't believe it was. So you think somebody put it there? I believe somebody put it there, yes. The Australia Post card that was found tucked into the front door of Brett Boyd's house. Yep. Two of your fingerprints on the back of it. Yep. How did they get there? Well, this is the problem with this card, okay, is I didn't believe that my fingerprints were on that card, and I was 100% sure that I'd never touched that card. So I took it upon myself to retain the services of my own fingerprint expert. My, my lawyer said, right, we're going to make an appointment. Thursday, that was. On the following Monday, we received a call from the police to say that the card had been lost. So we were never able to test if the fingerprints were on that card or not. He seems to have an explanation for every piece of evidence. Do you have any thoughts on his reaction to the evidence, Poppy? For every piece of evidence in this case, there's always a counter side. And it's really important to remember that he ultimately was found not guilty, but he was definitely the forerunner because of that sort of DNA evidence, the fingerprint. And they also had a handwriting analysis that I don't think was used in the final trial, but that, that was also part of the case. We know Brett survived the explosion, but was hospitalised with severe injuries. What was unexpected was when Roberto revealed during his interview for 60 Minutes that he visited him in hospital that first morning after the incident. If you had sent the bomb, mm. going to the hospital on the first day to see how the victim's going is a pretty clever strategy, isn't it? Yeah. OK. It's a very clever strategy, yes. But also, if a friend of yours gets hurt like that, it's also a normal thing to do to go to the hospital and to see if he's OK. That's a normal thing to do. Was Brett of the belief that Roberto had done this to him? Yes, he actually told police about the $80,000 debt that he said he owed Roberto. And they thought that this was a good enough motive and that formed part of their investigation into Roberto. But Brett's sister Susan said that, you know, for a long time afterwards, Brett was really tortured by this sense of injustice that he felt his friend had betrayed him and attacked him like this. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with true crime authors Poppy Damon and Elise Fines about the pseudo side of Roberto D. Heredia. A few months into the investigation of the Bell Rose bomb, Roberto was arrested, and while he was actually out on bail, he was shot at in a car park. Who do you think was responsible for that? We don't know. We still don't know who was responsible for shooting Roberto. He was shot from behind. He didn't see his attacker. Not long before that incident, Brett himself had been found waiting outside Randwick Police Station, uh, where Roberto was reporting every day because he was out on bail. And Brett was wearing a bulletproof vest, carrying a machine gun and a pistol, and apparently plotting to shoot Roberto, the motive being revenge, and possibly also his kind of deteriorating mental health. But he he didn't succeed, and we don't know who shot Roberto afterwards from behind, but undoubtedly would really have shaken Roberto up. He was shot at three times, once in the back, once in the arm, and another that went past his head. Robert says one of the bullets was almost fatal. It was only two millimetres away from hitting a main artery. But even so, when police offered him protection after the incident, he turned it down. These are the people who were putting things into my apartment in order to secure a prosecution against me. Do you now think I want them to protect me? Well, so you say. No. So you say. That's untested. So I say. And unproved. And unproved, yes. Unproved, but miraculous. 
He says that this threat against his life, along with the corruption he believed to be happening within the investigation, were the reasons he felt he had to fake his own death and escape the country. But police obviously didn't know what he'd done yet. The same month that Roberto was shot at, his car was found abandoned with traces of his blood. Did police think that could have been evidence he was dead, given it did look like he was being pursued by someone? So again, this is quite a disputed piece of evidence. So it was a month before Roberto was due to stand trial for attempted murder of his friend, Brett Boyd, and a parking officer actually found the car on the street in Sydney, as you say, smeared with blood. But it was definitely implying that something horrible had happened. The police initially, you know, obviously did consider that maybe he was dead. Fairly quickly, they realised that it was staged and that this had potentially been planted there. So they were already kind of close on the tail of Roberto de Heredia, though he admits that he had planted it there to buy himself some time. While the police were trying to work out what happened to him, he was able to skip the country. The action of faking his own death and escaping the country was deemed by many as suspicious. That's hardly the actions of an innocent man. It is the actions of an innocent man if you've been shot and if you've got evidence turning up in your apartment. I'm sorry, I'm not going to wait around to see what the next chapter holds because the next chapter is either death or it's prison. And where exactly had he escaped to? How had he even escaped the country when he was being pursued by authorities? So he originally escaped to Europe using a friend's passport where he would stay until 2016. So, you know, again, he says that the friend had lent him the passport. The friend, when questioned by police, said that it had been stolen So, you know, he managed to to go via Bali over to Europe, which is uh, pretty impressive. It's claimed he moved between London and Spain using the false names Robert Shorthouse and Robert Jackson while working as a currency trader. How long until he was caught? So it was uh, 16 years later, almost 17 years, that he was arrested at Gatwick Airport. Someone spotted that the passport was false or that the documents didn't line up. And they suddenly realised that this was someone who was wanted by Australian police and he was extradited back to Australia to face trial. And in those years between, Brett is living with these awful injuries that would have really affected his quality of life. What ended up happening to Brett? So his mental health really spiralled in the wake of the attack and then deteriorated even further after Roberto vanished. As I mentioned before, Susan says he was you know, really tortured and troubled by this sense of injustice and betrayal, because according to Susan, you know, Roberto was his best friend. And just dealing with really severe mental health issues, and he sadly ended up hanging himself in 2008, aged 36. And were his family really passionate about seeing justice? When Roberto was eventually arrested, how involved were his family in terms of being in the courtroom and watching this trial play out, I imagine that, you know, it would have been an incredibly emotional period. Totally. So Brett's sister, Susan, who was very close to him, you know, was incredibly invested in the trial, went every day and, you know, was devastated by the outcome. This is what she remembers from the moment Roberto was found not guilty. I felt so confident, so confident because of the evidence, the DNA, the handwriting, And when they said we find the accused not guilty, I literally let out this primal from the pit of my being. (gasps) Oh, my God. Oh, it was the pit. (laughs) And I shot up and I said to Rydia, you did it. I know it and you know it. But this wasn't a straightforward trial, was it, Poppy? There was actually two trials. So the first one resulted in a hung jury and then there was a second trial where he was found not guilty. And for Susan, it's really important that the case keeps being discussed in the media because as of yet, no one has been found guilty of the Belrose bomb, which feels like a lack of justice for Brett. And in terms of it going to a criminal trial and him being found not guilty, do we know why? Is it a lack of evidence? Was Did he have an alibi that meant he couldn't have done it? What got him off? Well, his first trial resulted in a hung jury. So he was tried for attempted murder and it was thrown out. A second trial was held. He was found not guilty. 
part of his defense was that he was the victim of a corrupt police investigation. And we don't know for sure if there was police corruption that was involved in the investigation of this bomb. But we do know that the officer in charge of the investigation, Ray Peaty, later served time in prison for corrupt conduct and that he had been involved in police corruption since the 80s. So while we don't have proof of police corruption in this case, we know that it was happening in Sydney at around this time. There's also the fact that, you know, a lot of the key witnesses were no longer around. I mean, Brett had sadly taking his own life. There was a sort of third man in the trio who was Leroy Stotzenheim, who had originally provided testimony. He had sadly died of cancer. So there really wasn't a lot of witnesses. One key witness was his girlfriend at the time, Ros Switzer, and her testimony had changed originally, you know, providing an alibi, then that testimony had changed. But all of these factors, you know, we obviously can't speak to the jury and ask them questions, but there was definitely, there's always two sides to every part of the evidence in this case. So it's a really hard one to land firm on what the true events of what happened. Has anyone else ever been tried for the Belrose bomb or has it just been Roberto? Just Roberto. No one else has ever been tried or found guilty. I wanted to ask, when Roberto left that car with the signs of his blood, and he left and he skipped the country. A lot of people saw that as an admission of guilt, firstly, but also as an attempt to fake his own death. Is that how you see it? We certainly believe that it did buy him the time that he was intending. And I think it, you know, it, the most convenient thing for him really would be the police stopped looking for him. So I think it would have really benefited Roberto had it appeared that he'd died. But it, actually, it's incredibly hard to fake your own death. I mean, he'd put a certain level of blood there, but you know, it wasn't huge quantities. So it sort of looked suspicious, but actually convincing the authorities that you've died is pretty tricky. And is faking your own death a crime? So in most jurisdictions, suicide itself is not a crime, but it's all the things that go around it. It might be that you have to make fraudulent documents. It might be that you try and claim on a life insurance policy. Uh, so it's sort of the, the fraud and the other things around it that are illegal. It's not inherently illegal in itself. Investigative journalists Poppy Damon and Alice Fines have extensive backgrounds in true crime. Their nine-part podcast series, Pseudocide, examines nine cases of people faking their own death throughout the ages. You can find a link to it in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Sound design is by Ian Camilleri and our producer is Gia Moylan. If you'd like to discuss today's episode with other true crime fans, then you can search True Crime Conversations on Facebook and join our online community. And if you don't want to miss a single episode, make sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.